if you have a tight or overactive hip flexor, you're, to understand why that is, you really got to understand it from a neuroscience perspective, from a brain perspective. Don't think about it from what is the muscle doing. You have to understand the muscle's behavior as dictated by the brain. So you have sensory input that goes into your brain through your vision, through your auditory system, through your brain's perception of its own movement or your body's movement, and then from signals from the ground. These are all vestibular signals that your brain uses to figure out where it is because your brain is blind. It's just trying to figure out incoming sensory input. So you have the incoming, incoming sensory input, you have the brain that processes that input, and then you have the muscular output. If you have an overactive psoas or an overactive hip flexor on one or both sides, you have an, a faulty processing issue, which is based off of faulty input. The muscles don't tighten up by themselves. They don't live in a vacuum. So to understand how to inhibit or turn off or relax an overactive hip flexor or psoas, you have to understand how the brain experiences movement and breathing. At the end of this video, there is a 20 minute interview that someone did with me where we talk about the impact of rhythm on the human brain and the human body. Everything in the body, everything in the universe, really, is governed by rhythm. And I talk about all of this in, those, in that 20 minute. But what you've got to understand is the hip flexors and the psoas respond to rhythm. So the, the left AIC pattern, as discussed in Myokinematic Restoration, it's a postural restoration course, this left AIC pattern, the muscles that you have to inhibit to get the pelvis out of the left AIC pattern, to inhibit this position, to get someone's pelvis neutral again, you have to inhibit the left psoas and the left rectus femoris, which are acting in concert with other muscles to hold the left side of the ilium forward, which orients the sacrum and the lumbar spine to the right and puts us into this position of right dominance. PRI calls it the left AIC, right BC, right TMCC pattern. I'm just focusing on the position of the pelvis right now. To get that process to change, to get this pelvis back so it can turn to the left so you can get on your left leg appropriately, you have to inhibit the left psoas and the left rect rectus femoris and facilitate or activate the left hamstring to do it. Now, this is the thing. Do you actually need a left hamstring to inhibit the overactivity of the left psoas and rectus femoris, which are keeping this pelvis oriented to the right? In fact, well, you do, but not in the way you think of it. And I'm gonna show a typical PRI technique a little bit later that is all about using your hamstrings to pull the pelvis back into a neutral position. But the point I'm getting across here, and I'm trying to, and I know it's gonna be in left, out in left field for a lot of people, that inhibition of a muscle, releasing a muscle, releasing a muscle is allowing, this is a definition, to release, allow something to move, act, or flow freely. When you're in this left AIC pattern, your body is not flowing freely. It's not flowing, remember that word, flowing. Inhibit, the word inhibit, this is why it's a better word. To inhibit means to discourage from true or spontaneous activity. So if you are inhibited, if your, if your hamstring is inhibited and your psoas and hip flexor are overactive, they are inhibiting your ability to flow freely, especially through the operation of inner psychological or external social constraints. So your behavior is inhibited by people telling you to shut up, to, to go to school, to learn this and not that, to, you know, to be seen and not heard. You're all being inhibited. We're all being, most of our issues are coming from childhood. There's still no doubt in my mind. Physical pain is a manifestation of what's going on in the mind. Assuming that there's no injuries, remember, or illnesses, just pain that you can't figure out where it's coming from. They, it didn't happen overnight. It came from psychological processes that probably started way back in your childhood, which create tension. And more tension in your body, the more you're gonna go into this pattern, because this is a pattern of tension. But when you get tense, you don't stay in the middle and you don't go to the left, you go to the right because of that bigger right diaphragm and how our brain functions. We are right dominant humans. And this is what the PRI testing is showing all the time. And the test that I show, this adduction drop test, which I've shown a million times on this website or on this YouTube channel, that is a test to show that the left side of the pelvis gets stuck forward because of the overactivity of the left psoas and the left hip flexors. But that is a neurological phenomenon. It is not a physical issue in an in and of itself. Yes, the body changes its position and gets shifted into this awkward posture. 
but it's coming from the brain. Remember, sensory input, processing, output. The input, the input does not have to be physical. It could be simply mental. Stress and tension will change your breathing. That will, if you, once you lose your diaphragms because you're neck breathing, well, this pelvis is gonna tip forward because the left psoas, which is integrated into the diaphragm, is gonna become tense and it's gonna put you in this position. So you end up in this position for a multitude of reasons, psychological, respiratory, and also inappropriate compensatory movement. There are two stages to changing the behavior of a psoas in a hip flexor. First, you have to inhibit it or release it. That is a neurological process, and then you have to retrain it to do the right thing. Inhibitions, let me just go through two different, stretching, forget about it. Stretching is dumb to your brain. Your brain doesn't learn anything from stretching. Remember, to change a muscle's behavior of a hip flexor and a psoas, you have to change its input. You have to change how your brain is using it. Simply stretching the muscle won't change a thing. What do humans do? We walk and we breathe. And your hip flexors and your psoas are both directly tied into walking and breathing. Your psoas is inseparable from your diaphragm. So you cannot, and I've made videos about this and you can see a dissection. When you pull on the, the psoas, the diaphragm moves. And we're, talking morally, we're mostly talking about the left side right now, but of course on the right side it's the same thing and the diaphragms are two different muscles. They're not the same muscle. So if you cannot breathe with your left diaphragm, which someone in this left AIC pattern, right BC pattern that postural restoration is always talking about. If you don't know what postural restoration is, this might be a little confusing to you. It might seem kind of out there, but this is how the brain and the body exist. You have a psoas that is directly tied into the diaphragm. If the left diaphragm cannot act as a pumping muscle, if you cannot diaphragmatically breathe with the left side, the psoas cannot release, it cannot let go because the diaphragm is directly influencing the use of that left psoas and the, and the hip flexors overall. So what we have is we have to inhibit that activity, that overactivity of the left psoas and the hip flexors through breathing and movement, which is what PRI is all about. So to have any understanding of the neurological process that I'm going to show in these videos, you have to understand the brain's experience of movement. And this is a neuroscience book. And I want you to go down to the third part. Motion is directly experienced by your brain. Motion is directly experienced from optic or tactile flow. And don't worry about the corollary, corollary discharge because it's not really necessary for this. Optic or tactile flow. Optic flow is your brain's perception of the environment moving past you as you flow through it. Tactile flow is your feet hitting the ground. It's getting tactile flow, which needs to be rhythmic. People who are in a left AIC pattern, which is essentially everyone that comes to see me for pain, they are offbeat. Their, their tactile flow from their feet is not equal on both sides because their body weight is shifted over to the right. If, in, if their pelvis cannot turn to the left because they have overactivity of their hip flexors and their rectus femoris, they cannot get their pelvis to turn to the left, so they don't spend the same amount of time on the left foot as they do on the right foot. They're spending a beat and a half on the right foot and a half a beat on the left. Now you could do a typical PRI technique to inhibit your overactive hip flexors by recruiting your hamstring. So you could just put your feet up on the wall like you're gonna see in this video. I pick my butt up. I'm gonna squeeze the ball with my knees. I'm sensing my heels, my heels are pulling down. I breathe into the nose, out through the mouth, pause for five seconds after exhalation, get all the air out. I'm feeling my hamstrings and my adductors. That is putting my femurs, my legs, into internal rotation. I'm sensing my heels, and that interoceptive sense of my own body and my heels pulling down, heels, allows my hip flexors to turn off. You didn't need to stretch them or release, well, that was releasing the hip flexors because it taught your brain how to do the opposite thing than what it was doing. But that's just changing the input. I put myself in a position to change the input for my brain to process the position of my body and sensory input differently so I could feel my hamstrings. Once you do that, the hip flexor shut off. Now, you, do, you can do that. It may or may not work because of a multitude of reasons that I've talked about on this YouTube channel for a lot of different reasons. There's a whole upper body that you have to deal with. So that is a typical PRI technique. It's called a 90-90 hip lift, but I'm gonna show a faster way to inhibit uh, hip flexors without doing a PRI technique. That can be used to retrain after you inhibit. 
that inhibits and probably retrains at the same time. But I'm just going about inhibition because my focus right now is on changing a behavior of a muscle. But to do that, you have to inhibit the overactivity by giving your brain something, a sense that it didn't have before. And that's what you're going to see next. So here's the hip flexor test. She cannot adduct her left leg. Her left hip flexors, her pelvis is forward on the left side. Her hip flexors are overactive. That's why she cannot adduct. I have her walk to music. All right, I sped it up. She's a dancer. And now she can adduct because of the rhythm, because she walked to the beat. Okay, so she can adduct. Now, what I'm going to show is I'm going to put her back into this pattern. I'm going to re I'm going to turn on her hip flexors on the left side by spinning her to her dominant side, which is the right side. She messed it up completely, but it was good enough. And now she can no longer adduct. Her hip flexors are on. Now I'm going to turn her to her non-dominant side, to her left. And we'll see what happens. That was a better spin. And now she can adduct. So that was a neurological process because we have a dominant right side and a non-dominant left side. The more you do stuff on the right, the more your brain pays attention to the right, and that's gonna bring that pelvis forward on the left because the brain is saying, well, you're always going to the right, so let's keep those hip flexors on. That's why dancing and rhythmic movement in general, just walking to a beat where your heels can hit the ground with the beat, that will never not work. I'm telling you, I've done it with every, I do it with everybody, I can do it with everybody. Uh, there's only two instances where it may not work. The last one, the first one is when you don't sense all your teeth, particularly your left molars. And that was my last video. And it got a lot of comments. A lot of people that, some people were pretty nasty because they didn't understand a thing about it and they thought it was hocus pocus. It's not. The individual could not sense their left molars. They could not sense lateralization of their body to the left because they didn't have a left heel left molars and left peripheral space all aligned, which is what you need for your brain to understand. Remember, your brain is blind. It needs appropriate sensory inputs for your body to actually stay over the non-dominant side. It doesn't have to work too hard to stay on the right side. It's going to do that pretty well. But the last video, that person could not inhibit their hip flexors. Same test because they couldn't sense their molars. All I had to have him do was sense his molars and his hip flexors turned off. And then I did a, a session with him. And by the end of the session, his hip flexors stayed off. He was no longer patterned. There's one other instance where this may happen, and it's a visual issue where someone will not, this, what I just showed, will not work. And it's because their vision is holding them in this pattern, and this is what you're going to see now. So with this individual, when I have him look close, he can adduct. When he looks in the distance, he can't adduct, so his hip flexors turn on. He has a visual behavior where his left eye loves to pay attention to the distance but doesn't love to pay attention up close. When that happens, that puts us over on our right side and our hip flexors get overactive. In the second half of the video, it's all sped up. In the second half of the video, I just put glasses on him that take off his left, that take away his left distance because I make it blurry and he can adduct no problem. So he has a visual issue. He can see 2020, but his brain has adopted a visual issue probably through compensation because he is unstable in the front of his left hip and his lower back as a way to stabilize his body over on his right side because he can't trust his left side. And we can't get past that. So what I just showed with my friend, the walking to the music, not going to really work too well with him. Or it could, but it won't last long. Once he comes to rest, into a, a stop, when he stops moving, he'll go right, those hip flexors will turn on again. Because you've taken away the brain's, those, that optic flow relaxes the body. Tactile flow relaxes the body. He can get tactile flow, but his visual system overrides that every single time. So he's going to need something, probably a special prescription that gets his brain to stop paying attention to the distance on the left and to keep it more aware on the, on, to, to not focus in the distance, but become more aware of his left periphery. Because teeth have to alternate. Right side, it's called chewing. Right side, left side. Right side, left side. Your brain uses that information. It's a rhythm. Right side, left side. We have to be able to do that, just like our feet have to go right side, left side. Our body has to go right side, left side. But our visual system also has to alternate from distance to near, distance, near, distance, near. And this happens as our head is rotating and our body is rotating as we walk very naturally. Periphery, no periphery. No periphery, periphery. The peripheries are still there, but it's what your brain is paying attention to. So this, your visual system has to be rhythmic, your masticatory system has to be rhythmic, your body has to be rhythmic, 
a pattern, a left AIC pattern, is simply a non-rhythmic pelvis. It's a body that's stuck on the right side. And that's what this interview is about, keeping rhythm in your life one way or another to keep your body more relaxed, to inhibit over inappropriate overactivity that's keeping you tense. That does not mean you're stable. I'm not saying you're stable. I'm, you still need to do a PRI program to restabilize everything. But if you kept more rhythm in your life and more walking in nature and environments that you felt comfortable in, you'd have a lot less tension and these patterns that PRI is trying to address would resolve way more easily. If you're still with me and you like this video, please give it a like, uh, a comment, or share it. That'd be appreciated. Thanks. Yeah, it's funny. You went on the journey of PRI, thinking about sometimes some pain you had in yourself. Oftentimes I do the same with, with me. Yeah. But, um, so I know I'm very right side dominant. Yes. And I think about the... Join the rest of humanity. Right. Because, because we all are. Could this lead to overuse injuries? So Absolutely. yeah, I'm definitely yeah. Yeah. leaning towards pain. Yeah. And some people may be right side dominant and never experience pain yeah. uh, in their whole life. And Absolutely. then some might. Right. So I guess those that are experiencing pain or, you know, is it from right side dominance? Is it from not being able to stabilize on their left leg yes. or right? That's, that's really what it's going to come down to for the most part. Yeah. So right side dominance is completely natural. There's books written about this. Even if you're a lefty? Yes, because you have yeah. a bigger right diet. There's two yeah. primary reasons yeah. that are easily explainable. The mm. bigger right diaphragm. Every time you take a breath, there is more of a twerk there's more of a pull from the bigger right diaphragm on the lumbar spine. Mm. So if, you, if I took your lumbar spine and push it in one direction or another, the rest of your body will orient that way. That's, that's, mm. They talk about, what is it, uh, L2, no, no, L4, L5, uh, that area in the sacrum is yeah. kind of the, mid, the middle of your body. Well, that's where the diaphragms are kind of influencing. Mm. So where that area goes, the body's gonna follow. So that bigger right diaphragm has more of an influence on the lumbar spine and sacrum mm. to the right that the left side can't compete with. Mm. So that's, that's a mechanical thing that's built into the way that we simply exist. Mm. But the other part is, and it's, it's fascinating, that both hemispheres of our brain pay attention. It has nothing to do with visual acuity, what your brain pays attention to out in the visual world. Both hemispheres pay attention to the right side. Mm. Only the right hemisphere pays attention to the left side. Mm. It's in the literature, that's not a PRI concept, but we use it right. because we know people drop off their left periphery and so we have to get them noticing the left side again. Right. But I would say those are the two biggest. And then the way that the hemispheres differ in their, in their function, right. there's a lot of overlap, but there's also specialization, particularly the left hemisphere for speech mm. and how it, how it sequences things, mm. how, it pay, how it pays attention to sequences, mm. uh, and then emotion and all these other things like when you read the brain science, right. the hemispheres simply aren't the same. Right. There's a lot of overlap, right. but there are some specializations for each hemisphere that will influence the way that we move and this right side of dominance. Mm. And 90% of the world is right-handed. Mm. The vast majority will kick with their right hand. Right. There's a reason for that. So right side dominance is the norm. It's not a problem until something happens that you become so right dominant that you're no longer really getting on your left side anywhere close to appropriately. Right. And at that point, you start to develop uh, instability, particularly through the left hip, mm. and at, because you're never fully on it. Because mm. your pelvis never fully goes to the left. Mm. You'll put mm. your weight on your left leg, but until you can... Now, this is where you could kind of talk about biomechanics. Right. If you can't get that pelvis congruent with the femur, Right you're not really using your left side the way it needs to be used. Mm. And over time, as you play sports, and you develop a lot of force to push forward, but you, on your left leg, you never use that left leg properly, mm. you're gonna to start to overuse the compensatory muscles to help stabilize things, which mm. will be the hip flexors and lower back muscles on the left mm. side, and eventually the neck. Uh, and that's where things become dicey, because you're gonna, the more you overuse those hip flexors and your lower back, it holds you rigid, mm. but not stable. Mm. And there's a difference as we were talking about before. And, and that's yeah. where, the, so the more unstable that left hip becomes, mm. the more pain is likely going to occur. So I often talk about like yin yang, accessing the spectrum. It almost sounds like just having access to that left side. It doesn't have to be equal to it the will never right, be equal. right? And it, it will, will never, never be equal. equal. No. But having access to it and being able to access it uh, yeah. 
in some form of way, um, I think would be the key there. Yeah. Yeah. With the appropriate muscles, right? And we know because you can you that's biomechanics. You can go there, right? What are the what are the muscles that have to be used appropriately, right. In left stance, you right. need a left hamstring, the whole the whole complex, yeah. The left adductor, the left glute medius, particularly the anterior portion, yeah. And your left uh, abdominals, your left internal obliques. That's what's going to stabilize the pelvis on top of that femur as you swing the right leg forward, yeah. And that's what we lose. Ever since I took PRI, I've always had it in the back of my head. And still, even when I'm doing dishes, if I'm having a conversation, if I, and I, I'm like, wow, I can shift onto my right and I can feel it. Yeah. I mean, I'm also an athlete who's right side dominant. Yeah. So I might even be more right side dominant than the average. Absolutely. And so, if, you, if you throw a lot with the right hand. Yeah, yeah okay. I punch, I do martial punch. arts. Yeah. And, yeah. But, um, and then I go to shift to the left. I'm like, oh, it gets me so frustrated because I can feel the big difference. Yeah. I'm not able, like, I really have to focus to get like an adductor on. I have mm -hmm. to focus to kind of, like my foot is always kind of, um, you know, I don't know if the camera could see this, but I'm forgetting the term where you're- Supinated or Supinated, tornated. right? Uh -huh. Correct, supinated. I'm always, I feel like supinated on the left a bit, uh -huh. where I'm not able to really kind of pronate enough to get the knee to line up over the ankle yeah. and I'm kind of like pronating and abducting shifting back and, and I'm like oh it's in my head <laughs> you're trying to get the sequence of events to occur right but something on the dominant side is not letting that occur okay it's not an issue of the left side not knowing how to work it's, the issue it will work it will work without a problem right once the dominant side lets go fully mm. it's never about the left side working harder mm. it's about inhibition of the overactive of the overactive right side mm. and then there's one area on the, particularly on the left your left lower and middle back that has to be inhibited also and right. inhibition is really a neurological process of the brain learning to not use something inappropriately mm. it's not about stretching you're right it's a neurological it has to resense how to be in a position appropriately but to do that, sometimes something on the right side is just not letting go completely because the brain is still saying, eh, I don't trust it. Right. That left hip, a little too unstable. Right. So I'm not going to risk it. I'm just going to stay over on this right side. Right. Which is, it'll work, but it doesn't work optimally. Right. It's still keeping you upright and you're moving forward, but not optimally. And that's the problem. And that's mm. when you start to have to use compensatory strategies. Not, not something the brain is using a strategy. It's just mm. moving you forward on mm. a body that's still just over to the right too much. Mm. So when it comes to rhythm and dance, so a big part yeah. of the conversation I wanted to have with you today is around yeah. that. Um, in a couple of my last podcasts, I uh, all, you know often ask questions such as like, should people experience the world more than be in a gym setting, and you know things in that realm and. But so bringing on the perspective of rhythm and dance, I saw some of your posts. It looked like you were speaking to the value of it. How could um, dance in particular help to, I guess, maybe fix some of these common malfunctions or just help people to be better movers? Or how does dance play a role in that? So it is complicated. It's actually very simple from a big picture perspective that the, the original, the, 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 the human body is governed by rhythms. Mm. How we breathe is rhythmic. Mm. Our heart rate is rhythmic. Our hormonal fluctuations through the day is rhythmic. And they That's know this. That's a very good point. Right? Yeah. Certain times of the day, you'll produce more cortisol, right? Mm. Like, I think it's early in the morning. But it's, it's your, your sleeping is rhythmic. Mm. Our I brain, think of that. It, everything is rhythmic. Yeah. These are patterns. There's an up and a down, a left and a right. Sunrise, it's a wave. Sunset. There you go. <laughs> Everything, and our brain entrains with that sunrise and sunset. Now, mm. sunrise and sunset does not exist. Because mm. if, if you go out to, out, out to space, that right. sun is going to be at you. you know, there is no sunset or sun. Right. You're just looking at the sun the entire time. Right. right? So that doesn't exist out there. Right. However, our brain entrains with sunrise and sunset because it's a cycle, because of mm. where, the, where the earth is in relation to the sun. But our brain entrains with those cycles of light and dark for sleep patterns. Mm. Even nocturnal animals, they just do it the opposite way. Mm. So everything in the, 
tidal, the, the tides. Mm. It's rhythmic. Mm. It's wow. gravity yeah. is a, from the moon. Me think. It's right. a, yes, <laughs> everything is rhythm. Right. Ups and downs, lefts and rights. All right, so everything flows. Mm. You can't flow if you're only on one side. Mm. You have to have two to flow. If the body doesn't have two sides, you can't flow. Right. So if you understand that from a big perspective, the human brain, that the whole body is governed by rhythm, rhythms, various mm. rhythms all at once, and the brain, the oscillatory activity of the neurons, mm. is rhythmic. Wow. Different hertz, different speeds. All different, and uh, there's, uh, there's books written about this, but that gets way too complicated. Just the point that the brain is also responding to rhythms, mm. and it's run on rhythms. So the auditory system and the motor system are intimately linked. And I have a, I could just read it if I can find it. Um, oh. Yeah. All right, so this is from Gait and Posture uh, Journal, Whitworth, 2013. Music and metronome cues produce different effects on gait spatiotemporal measures, but not gait variables. Forget about the title. But he says, <laughs> sound and human movement are closely linked due to extensive connections between auditory and motor brain regions. This is typified in the spontaneous synchronization of rhythmic, bo rhythmic mm. body movements such as foot tapping and head nodding to rhythmic music. This connection has been exploited in studies using, using rhythmic music or simple beats to cue rhythmic movements such as gait. Gait is a rhythmic movement. Mm. Any physicist, any neuroscientist will tell you if they talk about movement in the context of neuroscience or physics, of, you know, objects that fall, they will say that it's planned, falling and catching. Wow. It's rhythmic though. Right. It should be rhythmic. Hmm. But a pattern, someone who gets too stuck on their right side is no longer walking in a rhythmic way. Hmm. That's what the left, that's what these patterns are. So if you can't get on your left leg appropriately anymore and your internal metronome is now arrhythmic, hmm. You don't know that you're not on your left leg appropriately, but you're not on your left leg for the same amount of time that you're on your right leg. You see mm. it constantly because you see left shoulders higher than right shoulders, mm. no matter what foot they're on. If you go to your left foot, the left shoulder should drop and the right shoulder should come up. Mm. But when you're looking at someone with a higher left shoulder, which is completely normal, yeah. there's no way. If, they put their, if you watch them walk and there's no alternation between shoulder height, mm. They are not rhythmic. They are not spending the same amount of time on the left side as they are on the right. Mm. What happens when you're not rhythmic? Your extensor muscles will turn on. You're, all the things that cause us problems, the hip flexors, mm. the lower back and the neck, the extension fight or flight muscles will turn on to try to control that arrhythmic forward movement. Now you can't get out of that because you don't even know you're in it. Mm. <laughs> Yet, I know from doing what I do, Right. I can change all these ostensibly biomechanical tests like shoulder internal rotation, hip abduction and adduction tests. I can change all that by having an individual listen to music, 4-4 four, four timing, something with a strong beat that can be counted easily 1-2, one, 1-2 two, one, two, or 1-2, one, 3-4, two, but 1-2, one, 1-2, two, one, two, it doesn't matter. As long as they can time their heel strikes mm. with the beat, hip flexors are off, lower back is off, neck is relaxed. I do it all the time. It's almost like magic. I even did it with someone who had one functioning eye, mm. and that's not simple. Wow. We were, her, that one functioning eye is going to put her right back in the pattern the moment that beat goes away, Right. which I showed in my video. I have a video on this about on my YouTube channel. Right. I was kind of shocked that it worked. Right. She called me from Connecticut. She's like, you worked with my sister. I only have one eye that works. I don't know. I think you can help. And I said, I don't know, but we can experiment with music. She came down, and it worked. And I was kind of shaking. <laughs> like, I can't believe this is actually working. Wow. That we yeah. we got her brain to sense something different, mm. and her body completely relaxed. Now the problem was the moment we took away either the walking part mm. or the music part. And I'll go one step further. All she had to do was hear the rhythm, and visualize herself walking to the beat. All her tests changed. Wow. She didn't even have to wow. move. Wow. Visualize. She just had, yeah. She, all she had to do was visualize it. And I've wow. done this with other people also. I even had a friend who's a trained dancer, salsa right. dancer. All he had to do was watch me walk to the beat and he was neutral. Wow. Yes. That's Near wild. Neurons. Yeah.
So what do you think that's uh, attributed to? It's, yeah. it's cueing. It's, it's rhythmic. It's, that's right. what the brain works on. Right. So this is so another thing. Uh, our brain does not... The, the way that our brain makes sense of space, mm. or, or makes sense of where we are in space, it's getting cues mm. from the visual system, from optic flow. So that's your brain. It's not about seeing clearly. That's the important thing to remember. Mm. It's not about 2020 vision. It's about where your brain is paying attention to in space. Mm -hmm. But also, as we move forward through the world, the world is passing us by. Mm. That's called optic flow. Mm. Our brain gets signals. Our blind brain, remember, the brain is blind. It doesn't see, like, you're not seeing me. Right. Your brain is guessing as to what I look like based on the reflection of light off of me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And then past yeah. memories, because you can't. Your brain cannot, you can't process anything without past memories and mm. past instances mm. working on that visual system. Mm. So only 10% of the neurons going to the visual cortex is actually from the retina. The vast majority is from other regions of the brain. Mm. So when the brain is getting these, these, uh, these visual cues, it's automatically being mixed with what is this? Where was I the last time I saw this? It's trying to put this into context. Mm. So most of the connections to the visual cortex are coming from other areas of the brain. At any rate, so that's a fascinating aspect. Also. Right. It's really not yeah, about yeah. what you're seeing in that moment in time. Everything is being, it's mixing it with the, what it's hearing at the same time. You cannot separate sound and, past and vision. Experience. And past experiences, right. memories, threat. Right. Is this threatening or not? Or is it relaxing? Mm -hmm. Depending on what music you're hearing, it's going to be threatening or relaxing. Mm -hmm. If it's threatening, none of this will work. Right. I've done this many times with people. Right. Make them walk to music they do not like, they will not go neutral. Their right. hip flexors will stay on. Wow. Even if they are walking on beat. So what you like, what you enjoy, is huge for tension, for, for the, a decrease in tension. So it's, it can't be just music. It has to be yeah. music that you like, because then you have to go into dopamine. Right. And how dopamine is from the basal ganglia, is, is works with hearing. It's I making, can't remember what the original question was. Yeah, I went yeah. off on a tangent, no, that's but okay, all these it, things are part of it. Exactly. Um, and I'm okay with the tangents and wherever we go with this. But So it almost seems as though r rhythmic patterns are predictable. If something's predictable, Predi yes, that's it's it. comfortable. Predictable. Yes, it's predictable. So it, is it that the body recognizes rhythm as something comforting, in a sense? that it can relax. If it's the right rhythm. Right. Yeah. So right. If, if I had to listen to, so different cultures, so this is interesting, so different cultures have different uh, structures of music. Hmm. Uh, and I'm not a musician, uh, I've just studied a lot about music, but right. I, I don't know the proper music terms for it, but the scale in Indian music is not the same as Western music. Hmm. So if you're, if you're listening to unfamiliar cultural, hmm. uh, music coming from a culture, it's not the culture is that unfamiliar. Well, the culture probably unfamiliar also. Mm. But if the music is unfamiliar to you, your brain may not pick up the rhythm. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah, and so it, your brain may have to work too hard to try to figure out that rhythm because your our rhythm our there's, and there's a great book called Your Brain on Music. Mm. Yeah, Your Brain on Music, and he just talks the science. He's a neuroscientist and a musician, and he talks about how our musical tastes are pretty much set in our younger years, definitely mm. by our teenage years. That's why when people, it's like, oh, for me, the only good music was in the 80s and 90s. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> and for my parents, right. like, the only good thing was in the 50s and 60s. Right. So, you're, and they don't really change. Right. Like, that's where your musical tastes are pretty much set. So if, if, if music that you're exposed to when you're, like, 45, if you're exposed to it for the first time when you're 45, and it has no relation to what your musical tastes were set at when you were, you know, in your teenage years, mm. it may be hard to either like it Mm. You just might not like it, or it might be hard to pick up that rhythm, even if you are rhythmic. Mm. So, it, 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 so everything I'm talking about right now, how it puts a body at ease, mm. may not actually happen. It actually might stress you out. Good point. So it has so to be familiar or comforting music yeah, that it, that right. you find comforting. What right. two people find comforting and, and light, enjoyable may be completely different. Right. 